and at least a little bit at NASA as well, since those are the ones that we know that people are really excited about. Um, we also want to think about strategies for highlighting and integrating these kind of broader impacts uh, with scientific merit. So we are, as postdocs are generally pretty good about doing things and talking about the science. A lot of the time it can be really challenging to meaningfully integrate those broader impacts into that. And that's a major focus area for NSF in particular, but also for a lot of other funding agencies. So we really want to make sure that we can focus in on that. Um, we also want to kind of go back to the original genesis of this idea and think about strategies for developing these successful convergent science grants. And since we're kind of social scientists, and a lot of these, a lot of the convergent science work that goes on in atmospheric sciences is about integrating social and physical sciences. We're going to focus on that, but we're aware that convergent science goes beyond just integrating social and physical sciences. So we're going to make sure that we also have an opportunity to talk about the convergence of multiple physical sciences or multiple social sciences. So moving on to the less fun stuff, the stuff that the series probably can't do. Um, and this is a big list of things that's really just um, things that we're probably just not resourced to be able to do efficiently or really, really well as a group together. So these are things like helping with prioritization of the time that you spend searching for funding, writing grants, and conducting research. So prioritizing that, that's just going to be different for every postdoc, and it's going to depend on your supervisor situation and a number of other things. Um, help with searching for funding, help with describing like specific scientific merit of your kind of particular area in the grant, uh, or help with per, uh, persuasive or technical writing skills. These are things where there are resources in other areas that we think are really, really good for that. And they're also generally really specific to, to your particular project. And so we're hopeful that we can point out some resources as we go through for ways of getting at those things that um, kind of might be useful for you moving forward, but it's not something we're going to spend a lot of time on in our session. Similarly, um, thinking about walking just an individual postdoc through the entire process from start to finish of here's exactly how we put all these things together, then you do this, then you do that, then you do this. Again, that's going to be different for different funding agencies, for different kinds of calls, for different kinds of science. And so we're not going to be able to kind of dedicate the time it would take to make sure that we cover every special situation. Um, similarly, we're not going to be able to implement co-working groups for feedback on uh, grant proposals that are kind of in progress, even though we would love to, uh, it's probably not something that we have the resources to do. And I really want to emphasize this again, this doesn't mean that we don't think that these things are important, it's just that we don't have the capacity to do all these things well as a group. And so as a result of that, we would highly encourage you guys to work together uh, with interested peers, so other people who are here on this call, um, or also with kind of more senior scientists, so work with your supervisors, work with other people who are interested in some of the similar things that you're interested in, talk about this stuff, develop these skills. So if it's disappointing that we're not able to focus on these things, please, please work together to kind of make sure that you can get the skills that you need moving forward. And if you're really excited about one of these things that we probably can't do, I guarantee you there's like five other people on the call who are also really excited about that. So definitely talk about it as we move forward. So I'm going to finish up just by jumping through the schedule really, really fast. Like I said before, we're going to have six sessions that we're proposing. This is the first one. Um, and generally speaking, they're going to take place on Thursday mornings uh, during this time slot. So this is the time slot that we're going to use moving forward. This is the time that is um, it's the same time as our, our research reviews time. So as much as we would have liked to not put everything on a Thursday morning, it's so impossible to find a really, really good time for everybody. And this is the time that most of us just have set aside anyway for research reviews and things. And so having the opportunities to jump in here on off weeks uh, was too good to miss. So we're going to be coming in on Thursday mornings. It's going to be, generally speaking, every two to three weeks up until the middle of November. Uh, we're going to start here with the overview session, and then we're going to get into some really interesting kind of special situations. So on the 6th of October, we're going to be thinking about granting organizations, procedures, and policies. So um, I believe we are focusing on NSF and NOAA for that. We're trying to get together some NASA resources as well so that people have opportunities to look at that moving forward. Um, our third session towards the end of October is going to be focusing specifically on NCAR and UCP policies and protocols. And then when we get into the beginning of November, we're going to be thinking about project logistics. So this is going to be thinking about kind of um, this big process that we've got going on with all of these things, but also digging into those specific sections that we were talking about before that are often neglected um, and are outside of the realm of our experience in general. Then later on in November, we're going to focus down on research relevance and broader impact. So thinking about translating some of the scientific science that we're doing into broader impacts that affect other people and other kind of important situations. And then we're going to take a big long break for the holidays. 
And we're hoping sometime in early January to come back and really focus in on convergent science. And so again, we're going to be thinking a lot about integrating uh, atmospheric science and social science, but also kind of digging into some other areas as well. Um, so definitely check your emails for invites to the upcoming sessions. You're going to get a new one for each one, um, and it should just pop up in your calendar slot as well. But if uh, any of you have questions about those, please feel free to reach out to us and we can go from there. And now I think we're going to be jumping into our speakers. I'm not entirely sure who's up first, but I think you'll recognize your slides when you see them. So thanks, guys, for kind of listening in. And remember, if you have questions, Definitely jump on here. If anything that I said doesn't make sense and you have questions about what that looks like, if you have excitement about stuff that you want to really want to make sure that we cover moving forward, uh, definitely highlight those in a slide of question in the Q&A session, and then we'll make sure that we, uh, at the end, have a chance to go through this. I'll go ahead and jump in here, Hugh. Um, it looks like I am the first one up. Um, so good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Landolt. I'm the ISP Science Advisor. Um, I've been in this position for a little less than a year, uh, but I have been at NCAR for uh, going on 26 years now. Um, so in that time, um, I've had the opportunity to work on a wide variety of all sorts of different grants and proposals. Um, I've written uh, proposals to NSF, I've written proposals to NASA, I've written proposals to NOAA, um, the FAA, private industry. I, I've been really kind of all over the board in terms of the, the different proposals and stuff that I've worked on. Um, so Hugh, Mariana, and, and Suda came to me and asked if I could uh, give an overview of some of the stuff that goes into the proposals, uh, things that I've worked on. And the, the components that you see listed here um, are really components that go into primarily an NSF type of proposal. Um, and I, as we go through these, um, and I'm going to keep this somewhat high level, uh, we'll, we'll get into a lot of these details later in some of the other future sessions, as Hugh was mentioning. But I want to at least give you kind of a, a little bit of a taste, an idea um, of the types of things that you're going to have to consider when you sit down and you want to actually do some type of an in-depth proposal to NSF. Um, and I understand looking at these different things, it, it looks a little bit daunting. I, I'll use that word since I know a lot of you have already used that um, here at the beginning. But um, I do want to say when it really comes down to it and you really look at um, proposals and stuff that people put out, it's not a whole lot different than looking at um, some sort of a research paper um, or a publication that you would put out. Um, there is a flow to them. They have a background section and abstracts um, of sorts. Um, and then instead of getting into like a methods and a results type of thing, that's really where you transition over to actually talking about what it is that you want to propose and what it is that you would expect um, to find with the research that you are actually proposing. Um, so I, we'll walk through some of these. I'll give you a little bit more detail on some of them. Some of them are fairly um, self-explanatory, so I'm not really going to hit on them again. But um, it, as far as the components, the, the project summary, um, you could almost consider that to be your abstract of sorts if you were writing a publication. Um, and then you get into the main body of it, the project description. Uh, sorry, go back for just a second, Hugh. Um, I'm just going to touch on these real quick. Now, the project description, also known as the statement of work, those terms get used interchangeably uh, depending on the type of proposal that you're using. Uh, references, just like you would see um, in an actual publication, you are definitely going to have references that are going to go along with your proposal. Um, a biographical sketch, the budget, um, any type of proposal that you do is going to have a budget. Um, it, that's, that's, that's a given. Um, current pending support, facilities, data management plans. Um, data management plan is really something that's becoming more and more important, um, especially when you're talking about NSF or NASA or NOAA because they want to know how you're going to manage that data and how you're going to make it accessible to everybody once you've had your chance to do your data analysis. Um, and then supplementary documents. Um, so let, let's dive into a few of these um, here in a little bit more detail. Um, you can go to the next slide now. Uh, thank you, Hugh. Uh, so the project summary, and again, this is kind of an NSF uh, emphasis. Um, and as we're going through these, I'm also going to give you an idea um, of which ones may or may not also show up in different types of proposals. Um, some of it is going to be dependent on funding level, who you're who you're sending it out to, private industry versus government versus other things. Um, but almost everybody is going to want some sort of a, a project summary. 
um, explaining what it is that you want to do. So as I mentioned, that you could view this as an abstract um, when, you, when you're writing these. Um, generally, they're one page uh, maximum, and they really highlight your primary objectives. Um, what is it that you are actually proposing that you want to do? Um, and usually within that, again, with this NSF emphasis, they want you to highlight what the intellectual merit is. So what is your proposed research addressing? Um, why is this important? And if you're doing this research, you're obviously doing it for a reason. You should have somewhat of an idea of what the expected outcome is. Uh, it doesn't mean that's what the outcome is going to be. As all of us know, you can do this research and find something that is completely different than what you were expecting. Um, but at least have an idea of what you expect to get out of this. Um, in terms of broader impacts, um, you want to discuss partnerships, outreach opportunities, um, highlight student involvement or student opportunities, particularly when you're talking about undergraduate or graduate students um, that may be working with you or in some sort of a collaborative sense. Um, and you don't necessarily even have to have those people identified. Um, but the, the, the idea is to at least give some thought um, to, to who you would like to see getting involved with this project um, and um, the knowledge and stuff that you can pass on, the excitement um, that you can instill in other people so that they want to continue um, pursuing this as they grow in their career. Um, that, that's kind of the idea behind that particular section. Uh, next slide here. Uh, the project description or this, the statement of work, um, and oftentimes you'll see statement of work uh, abbreviated as SOW, um, and you may see that uh, some later coming up in some additional slides. I just want to call out what that is. It is really just a description of what it is. This is kind of the bulk of your proposal. This is where um, you are going to talk about what it is that you want to do. Um, in terms of NSF, generally, they're kept to 15 pages or less, which does not include the references. Um, and 15 pages may seem like a lot, but when you consider that you're probably going to have figures in here, um, you have to do an introduction uh, with a background, just like you would with a scientific publication, uh, where you want to talk about prior research, um, give the, the funding organization, um, the, or show the funding organization, rather, that you have done your homework, you know what the prior research and stuff has been done, um, and talk about your motivation and how you're going to start building um, on what others have done. Um, also, your objectives. Um, and by objectives, we really mean, what are your hypotheses? What are your research goals? Um, this is where you want to start calling that information out and make it very clear um, what it is that you're proposing. Uh, in the uh, proposals and stuff that I've done, particularly with NSF, uh, usually we'll have just a straight up objective section and we will list um, numerically and state number one, this is, one, this is the first objective, this is the first hypothesis, number two is the second. Um, and so forth, so that it's very clear, it's very obvious what it is that you are proposing to do with your particular proposal. Um, next, since you're probably going to be dealing either with instrumentation or modeling um, in the majority of the proposals that you're gonna be working on, you wanna go into a little bit more detail about what it is you're going to be doing with them. Um, if you need to do observations, um, you need to purchase instruments. You need to call that out here. You need to explain why that's important, what they're going to do, the types of data that you expect to collect with those particular types of sensors. Um, if it's going to be modeling, um, what's, what are the resources you need for the modeling? Are you going to need supercomputing time? Where is that supercomputing time going to go? Is it going to stay with an NCAR? Is it going to go to another organization? How is that going to get paid for? what is the expected outcome, uh, those sorts of things. So instrumentation, uh, modeling language, all of that is good to put in there as well. And again, make sure that you're clear so it's obvious what exactly you're going to do. Um, and then of course, methods. When you get um, into the hypothesis, this is a section where you can actually go into a little bit more detail. Explain a little bit more about what your hypotheses are, um, what you expect uh, to see from the, the research, um, and how that research is going to be important. Um, what, what are the expected outcomes? Why are you doing this? What are going to be the long-term benefits uh, from doing that sort of thing? So um, again, kind of a high-level explanation, but these are the things that you wanna make sure you absolutely have in any type of project description or statement of work. 
Um, continuing on, so that's that's going to be kind of the, the the first part of your project description. There also needs to be a project management component. Um, and oftentimes, if you put in a proposal, it's probably going to be a multi-year proposal. Uh, many of the NSF proposals can be anywhere from three to five years. Um, so you need to do a breakdown by year. Um, you want to talk about expected or anticipated results, um, maybe by year or maybe as a whole by the time you get to the end of the actual project itself. Um, broader impacts I touched on in the introduction, you're going to want to hit uh, hit that pretty hard here. Um, again, talk about community outreach, educational opportunities uh, for graduate students, for undergraduate students, even potentially postdocs, um, expected student involvement, even touch on early career development. And when we say early career development, we're talking more about you yourself. How is this going to help you as an early career scientist develop your career? What do you expect to learn from it? Uh, that sort of thing. So all of that is uh, really good information to put into your broader impact statement. Um, and then finally, there's the current and pending support from the sponsor. So uh, NSF requires this. Not all organizations are necessarily going to require this. Um, in fact, um, FAA has never required this. Uh, private industry generally doesn't really care. They just want to know what it is that you're going to do type of thing. But NSF wants to know if you're being funded under other money from NSF. Um, other types of government sponsors, things like that, just as kind of a background information to them so they know um, what your base funding is in terms of other projects, your other commitments, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you'll also, again, um, talk about intellectual merit and broader impacts for each of those different projects that you're working on. Um, so you're, you're starting to see a theme here of intellectual merit and uh, broader impacts continually coming up in these various different sections because NSF puts a lot of emphasis on uh, those particular things. Uh, next you. Um, in terms of a biographical sketch, um, you can really just think of this as a shortened CV. Um, the emphasis here is going to be on your research or your experience pertinent to what it is that you're proposing. Um, these are typically only a couple of pages long, and you can see the various different things that go into that. Um, it's really just kind of a, a list of what is your educational background, any scientific appointments that you have, uh, publications that are relevant to what you're proposing, any type of synergistic activities that you're involved with, listing your collaborators um, on some of those different projects or who may be working with you on this one. Um, and then also listing your graduate and your thesis advisors, um, just so they, again, background information for them. Uh, these are usually pretty quick and easy to put together. They're short, they're not intended to be long, but they give the maximum information to NSF so they know exactly what your, your skills are and how it's relevant to what you're proposing. Uh, the budget. Um, probably uh, one of the most important things that's going to go into this, aside from the project description, is the budget. Um, and you really need to think very closely about this because you need to account for everything that you're going to need in a monetary sense for your project to be successful. Um, that includes salaries um, for yourself, um, any postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate students, other personnel, software engineers, um, other scientists and stuff that may be helping you out. Uh, travel needs to be included, any type of equipment or materials and supplies that you would be purchasing, that needs to go in there. Computational facilities, if you're going to be doing supercomputing, you need time on the supercomputers, you need to account for uh, the money for that. Uh, publication costs, because you're obviously going to be publishing your results and stuff, you need to make sure that you anticipate costs for the publications to build into this. Um, any type of sub awards, if there's another organization that's going to be working with you where the money's going to come to you first and then you need to transfer it to them, that's considered a sub award. You need to account for that in here. Um, also, indirect costs, overhead, benefits, um, that sort of thing. All of that goes in here. Um, on that particular point, I want to say that people like Carolyn and Valerie and Caitlin, um, they are an excellent resource for that sort of thing. And a lot of the budget templates that we use when you go in and you fill it out with your travel and salaries and stuff, we'll automatically calculate that stuff for you. Um, so you don't have to go in and figure that stuff out on your own. A lot of it is already kind of done in the background. Um, and then, of course, you need a budget justification. Um, you need to explain for all of these different things exactly why that money is needed and um, why the amount of money um, is, is needed for those different sections. 
Um, and again, it's fairly straightforward. If you're buying a sensor, you'll need to get a quote for that sensor, put it in there and say, here's the quote for the sensor. That's your justification for needing that. Uh, next slide here. Uh, facilities, equipment, other resources. Again, this is an NSF thing. It's not so much something that you're going to see in other proposals, um, but you want to describe the facilities that we need to use to support the project. Um, any type of laboratory use, potentially any type of supercomputing use, um, even describing existing equipment that you have, um, maybe from other projects and stuff. That's where you want to put this in here to show that you've got other things that you're bringing in that's going to help support this. You're not asking for money to build everything from the ground up. Um, so all of that would go into this facilities, equipment, and other resources section. And finally, the data management plan. Um, again, it's becoming more and more important, especially to organizations like NSF and NASA and NOAA, that they want to know what are you going to do with this data, um, particularly once you've done your analysis, once you've done your publications. Um, if they're paying for you to collect the data, they don't want the data to just disappear. Um, so what are you going to do in the long term in case there's other scientists, other graduate students, postdocs that come along that may be able to use that data set for research that they are doing? Um, where can you host that data? Where can you put it somewhere that they have open access to that data um, and provide an explanation for how that data is going to be archived and disseminated? Um, so I think that's, that's the last of my slides. And again, um, the word daunting comes to mind. Um, but if you approach this from the perspective that you're doing this like a publication, um, this is something where you have the opportunity to be creative. People like Valerie, Carolyn, and Caitlin, um, those are the people that are here to help support you, help answer questions, and they're the ones that are gonna walk you through this process um, and, and support you in being able to put together a strong type of uh, proposal. Um, and I'll also say, I myself am here. If anybody has any questions, you start working on some of these things, you're not sure what to do. I'm always available. I'm always willing to help um, get a second pair of eyes on, especially when it comes to the scientific component. Um, when it comes to more of some of these other details on how to get the proposal submitted, things like that. Uh, Valerie, Carolyn, Caitlin, all of them are more your, your experts for doing that sort of thing. Uh, but when it comes to writing these things up, the material to put in, reviewing it, I, I'm more than willing to help you out with that. Scott, thank you so much. Uh, that was really great going through all of these different pieces. And, and again, thank you so much for being available to kind of discuss all these things. I know that that's going to be super, super useful for everybody. Um, Carolyn, Caitlin, um, I know that you guys are kind of switching off with Valerie going through the next two things. So if you want to Take it away and just let me know when you want me to move the slides. Yeah, thanks, Hugh. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Valerie Cook. Um, I've been with NCAR for about 17 years, and um, the, probably the focus of my position is on compliance. And NCAR is a federally funded research and development center, and we do have a, an overwhelming number of policies um, that we have to follow. So the purpose of my office is to help you navigate that. And then also, I really enjoy working with others to see where we can um, navigate flexibility around um, the rules that we have. So my door is always open and happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Hugh had mentioned earlier that this series is not going to focus on finding funding opportunities, but I did want to let everybody know that that is a big role that our um, office plays, not finding the opportunities, but reviewing the opportunities once um, somebody contacts us and says they're really interested in responding to this announcement. Um, we have a full website of all of the announcements that we've reviewed, and we've indicated whether or not we're eligible and if there's any other um, unique things that you need to um, watch out for. So we update that website regularly. Um, so it is a great resource, even though it doesn't have every single opportunity out there. There's also opportunities that come up every single year, like the NOAA CPO announcement. And we know that we'll have a lot of submissions in response to that announcement. Um, we watch for the release of that announcement, and then we review it and then send out a mass email um, to the administrators that um, this is now available. and. Um, to start preparing for your proposals. 
So I'll talk a little bit about the um, eligibility review, both for sponsors and then um, a little bit about our PI eligibility. Um, various sponsors um, have different requirements. Some sponsors may have eligibility requirements um, by sponsor and overarching eligibility, whereas other sponsors are going to do it on an announcement by announcement basis. Um, DOE is a great example, as well as NSF, that just because you were NCAR as an FFRDT was eligible on one announcement doesn't mean they'll be eligible on the next announcement. So we really want to review every single announcement before you spend any more time um, pursuing that funding avenue. Um, we also have a lot of eligibility restrictions with NSF. I am the point of contact with NSF on determining um, eligibility. So I do talk to every program manager um, to determine if we're eligible or not. So our recommendations are to contact your proposal administrator um, as soon as possible when there's an announcement that you're interested in um, responding to. And then again, the entity proposal offices will review those announcements and discuss with the sponsors as appropriate. Now I know I'm speaking to the postdoc group. So when we talk about um, you know, finding funding opportunities, there is um, a UCAR wide PI eligibility guideline. I posted the um, link there. Um, postdocs do have to meet um, specific criteria and um, your eligibility would need to be approved by your lab or center director as well as um, NCAR or UCP entity. Um, deputy director. So the work, we want the work to be um, specific to the postdoc. Um, we would prefer that the work be completed during your employment with UCAR and that the work is a strategic priority for NCAR. Now that said, that is PI eligibility. There are a lot of opportunities for postdocs to serve as co-PI or co-PI on a proposal if um, you know, somebody else within your lab will serve as the PI. So there's, there are opportunities out there. I think next slide, please, here. Um, the next thing we want to focus on is um, when we are sure that we're eligible for an announcement, um, the postdoc is going to serve as PI or co-PI. Um, everyone is required to go through a proposal training before submitting a proposal. Um, it's a video that we send out. Um, it's it's old video. We need to redo it, but everybody needs to watch it. Um, and then you are required to complete a salary access acknowledgement form because within the um, systems that we have, um, you do have access to salary information. Um, so contact your proposal administrator for a link to the training video. They'll send that out. Um, the video focuses on proposal preparation and submission, award management, and financial management. Um, there's also a lot of registrations required for your sponsor systems, so um, particularly nsfresearch.gov and NASA Inspires, we have to get you registered in those systems. And then now a lot of sponsors are requiring completion of your CV and CMV, CVs and CMPs in um, Cyan CV. Registration is required for that. And then another thing to note is that starting in January 2023, NSF is going to require each um, PI or co-PI to certify their effort in Cyan CV. So we want to get started on all of these processes as soon as possible. And at this point, I will turn it over to Caitlin or Carolyn. Um, I am up next. So, hey everyone, I'm Caitlin Quinn. Um, I'm an administrator in the High Altitude Observatory, or HAO, um, and I am the proposal or the lead proposal administrator for our group, and I've been serving in that capacity for about five years now. Um, I love working on proposals. I definitely have um, the most expertise in NASA and NSF, so I tell everyone if you have any questions, you want to talk through requirements and specifics, um, you're always welcome to come chat with me or send me an email, set up a meeting. Um, and I just want to thank, you know, Valerie and her office, the Budget and Planning Office, for all of the um, sort of guidance um, that they provide us and the wonderful reviews that they do of our proposals before they go out the door. Um, so I'm just going to take a minute or two here to sort of touch on the proposal development process, which, um, you know, we've heard an overview from Scott about some of the pieces that go into that. But you might be wondering about sort of the timeline and the process and how that all works. So. 
Um, this is sort of representing maybe a more typical um, sort of smaller to medium sized research project. Of course, the timeline for proposal development is going to vary drastically depending on sort of the, the opportunity you're participating in. But this is sort of a typical example. Um, usually that development process is going to start about three months prior to submission and that will typically coincide with a pre-proposal now what the pre-proposal involves is going to vary by sponsor um, in the nasa world that's called a sort of step one um, in the nsf world they might call it a preliminary proposal or maybe something called a notice of intent but basically it's sort of a small snippet of your overall proposal that you'll develop well in advance of submission, and it gives the funding, um, uh, the sponsor, an idea of sort of, you know, how many submissions they're working with, they can start to develop review teams, and um, it also helps you to sort of hone in on your concept well in advance. So typically the step one will involve, you know, developing your team and maybe an abstract. Um, and, you know, after you've sort of gone through the process of checking on eligibility, getting registered and approved in all of those systems that Valerie mentioned, that's when the real work begins. Um, so in those few months before the due date, you're going to be working closely with your proposal administrator. So someone like me or Caroline, um, and we're going to help you sort of review requirements, develop a proposal timeline, and we'll also help you to generate certain content in that proposal, like the budget, um, the budget justification, sort of looking at this example block in blue about a NASA proposal, maybe all of the content there from biologic, sorry, biographical sketches all the way down to facilities and equipment. Um, and additionally, you're going to be working closely with your mentor and your proposal team. Uh, the mentor can help you sort of develop teaming, maybe identifying co eyes collaborators who could help you to do that sort of proposed work. Um, and of course, they will be helping you writing the science and technical proposal. Um, I have highlighted here, um, or bolded, sort of the reviewing the solicitation step. And I just want to call that out as sort of a very important first step as you're sort of digging into working on the proposal. Um, it kind of helps to go through, highlight important information, and maybe even start an outline from the solicitation so that your response will sort of follow the exact format that reviewers are going to be uh, looking at. Um, and of course, each solicitation has very specific requirements, different content and sections and format. And then further, to complicate things, of course, uh, sponsors. Different sponsors have different requirements. Uh, maybe page uh, length requirements are different, or the font could be different. And those are meant to sort of put boundaries on the length of your proposal and make sure that we sort of have a level playing field when they are evaluating things. So that's something you definitely want to keep in mind early. You don't want to write your entire proposal and find that your font is too small and you have to cut out entire pages of content that you wrote. So it's early or it's important to sort of identify that early. And of course, if you ever have questions about that, definitely work with your proposal admin. Um, if we have questions, we can always work with the budget and planning office. Um, so Hugh, if you could go to the next slide, um, I have just sort of put together a sort of um, an example of what a proposal development timeline could look like. And this is something, of course, you'd work closely with your proposal admin on. So um, T minus zero here is going to be the date that your proposal is submitted. It leaves the organization and either goes to the sponsor if you're the PI or it goes to sort of the lead institution if maybe, um, you know, you're the co-I on the proposal and they are leading the entire effort. But about three months ahead of time is when pre-proposals are typically due. So that's when you're going to get the team finalized. Uh, the abstract will be written. You'll probably finalize a title for your future project. Um, and then once that's submitted is when the real proposal writing can begin. And you'll start to sort of, you know, interact with your team members, getting that outline started and sort of writing the meat of that proposal. Um, maybe about one to two months out before submission is when you'll start working closely with that proposal admin. You could start to develop the budget, that sort of non-technical content, maybe describing, you know, the, the bios, the CPs, things of that nature. Um, and additionally, if you are the PI and you have external funded partners, um, we have to send them requests for proposals. They need to provide us with budgets and their own descriptions that we later incorporate to the overall package. So you need to give them enough time and their um, organizations to sort of prepare those documents and get them reviewed and approved. Um, and I'd say maybe sort of the two weeks before the proposal goes out is when things really ramp up. Um, Caroline has some slides that are going to follow that will go into this in a bit more detail. But these two sort of internal deadlines that you'll see in that green text there that I want to call out are those business days sort of ahead of submission. 
10 business days prior is when the BNP office asks that we get the final budget completed and we respond to something called NCAR criteria responses. And that's to sort of certify to, um, you know, because we're an FFRDC and we get that um, base funding, that this research sort of won't compete with that. Um, so we do that 10 business days ahead of time. And then three business days before we're planning on submitting, we give a full complete package to budget and planning office. And they're gonna go through all the details, make sure that everything is compliant. And if they find any issues, that gives us a little bit of time to sort of resolve those issues and, um, and work them into the final submission. So um, I will now pass it over to Caroline and she's gonna go into um, sort of getting your final proposal ready for submission. Hi everyone, so I'm Caroline and I work um, in MMM and like Caitlin, I help with proposal submission and I've been here for about seven years. So I'll move fast so we have time for uh, questions at the end, but you know, once you get your final proposal ready, your lab, you know, Caitlin and I and the others, we really are the ones that guide it through the next phase. So we'll take it, we'll upload all the pieces into the submission platform, NSF, grants.gov. We answer all, you know, the technical questions, all the forms. At this stage, we're trying to make everything look uniform. They look good. We put dates page numbers, you know, we are just as excited as you. We want you to succeed. So we really um, work with you to make it look great. And we should start all this about three days before the submission. Or if you're working with a university, which a lot of times, you know, they'll tell us they want a week prior. So we have to, you know, start a week earlier to meet their deadline. And you can move forward, Hugh. And so this is kind of uh, the review process. So we are super lucky at NCART to have such a checks and balance system. So the first, you know, you'll get your proposal done. We like three days prior. I look through it or Caitlin and we make sure everything looks good. Then we send it through the Panda system and your lab director will have a look, you know, make sure it fits in with your lab's goals, implementation plan. They want it to look good too. And then Valerie and her team are fantastic. And they look through it with a fine tooth comb. They make sure it looks through policy. They check for grammar. And it, I mean, going out the door, we have an extremely high success rate. And, um, you know, as Scott, who mentioned, we, we do everything but the technical support, basically. Like your admin will be here to help you, like, develop a budget, budget justification. We do your CMPs. We work with you for your CVs. We're really, we want you to succeed. Like I get so excited. So, um, but I can't write your science because I don't know your science. So really you have a person, right, to help you move along and you're not alone. And, uh, you know, once we get the final copy, I email it to you to say, hey, does this look good? You know, are you okay with it? And the budget and planning office is the one that will press that button and submit it. And then we wait, you know, it's usually about three to six months and you'll hear uh, usually the good news. And if not, you know, um, we always say you can try to submit the following year, right? You have this great idea. A lot of PIs will revamp it and submit it the following year and, and it's successful. That's it. Everybody, thank you all so much. That was so cool. I think I can safely speak for all of us and say this is everything that we were really hoping to hear so much about. So this is great. We've got a few minutes left for questions. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that everybody who wants to ask a question has a chance to ask. Um, I'm going to start with one from Slido really fast from the people who've been posting them on there. If you want to keep posting them on there, we can also collate those and see if we can find some answers for them moving forward. But um, I think, Caroline, this kind of touches on the last point that you made. Uh, you talked about having a really, really good success rate. Can you give us a sense of kind of what your expected ratio of applications to successfully funded proposals has been? Does it run the gamut across different kind of departments or different funders, or is it, generally speaking, a, a pretty solid success rate? Valerie might be able to speak too on this, you know, um, I would say extremely highly, you know, we, we put in the best proposals that we can, right? Um, if it's a very extremely, uh, and Valerie can speak, some will only accept, you know, three, Valerie and her team will actually pick like, well, you can go into it, Valerie, but. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> we do have a high success rate here at NCAR, probably higher than the university community, but um, it's about 50, 50 to 55 percent success rate. Um, universities are around um, 20 to 30 percent. Um, but it does vary by sponsor, and we do have a lot of proposals that we submit that um, are not peer reviewed. They're called like sole source proposals. So the chances of those getting awarded are much, much higher. So when we look at it on a sponsor by sponsor basis, um, it, it could be around that 30% range. So for the, for the peer reviewed proposals. Okay, I'm going to ask if anyone here in person has any questions that they would want to yeah. ask. I have a really small question. So for budgeting stuff, do you have to do, I don't know what they're called, but universities like a competition, essentially like showing bids if it's above X thousand dollars? Like, okay, I'm going to do a survey. It's going to cost 10 grand and I have to show that I did like three different bids. Do you have to work that into your grant too ahead of time? Do you know what I'm talking about? There's certain expenses. If you have to spend above a certain amount of money, you have to show that you got the best offer or something like that, or explain why you didn't. Does NCAR have that policy too? No, not sure. Quite sure I understand the question. So it might not be um, applicable here. Well, can you repeat it, please? Yeah, so like if you spend over a certain amount of money, like in most departments, in most universities, like across the board, it's above $5,000. You have to show that you've gotten a bid for that from at least three different vendors or competitors to say that it's worth like you actually have to spend this much money and you're getting the best price on it. Yeah, Caroline or Caitlin may be um, better able to answer that question. So that's more on your procurement side. Yeah, I'm... <sighs> I think it depends. I know if like you have maybe materials or something in your budget, you'd certainly want to have a basis of estimate because you'll have to communicate that to the sponsor in your budget justification. I think doing like a sort of um, competitive procurement like you are describing would only apply if you had services. Um, I want to say the threshold is over $15,000, but I think even at the proposal stage, it's probably acceptable to um, just sort of state what the basis is for those costs and knowing that in the future you may need to do a competitive bid for those. Um, perhaps if, um, yeah, I, I want to say that the $15,000 is the um, range is where that gets cut off. Um, okay. And of course, you could you, you could name a partner and if you have a compelling reason that you need to work with them, you build that into your proposal. Um, but if it's just some generic services to be fulfilled at a future time, you would do that you know, at the time of award. I'm working with the contracts group. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. You do you want to take another question from the Slido, and then we'll come back again to the other one? Yeah, I think there's just uh, we probably just have time for one more question, so I'm going to read one more off the Slido that also got uploaded um, a little bit. Um, so I want to talk about uh, let's see. Some scientists have been obtaining funding from private or philanthropic sources. So how usual are those, and are there mechanisms to find those? Sources? I can take that one. Um, so we do occasionally submit proposals to foundations. It's not as common. Um, usually you have to develop a relationship with the foundation before you can be eligible to submit a proposal. There are a few foundations that have more of an open solicitation process. Um, Schmidt, um, the vestry um, announcement is one that we've done recently. Uh, the UCAR President's Office does um, offer funding available. Um, it's not on a competitive basis, sort of like a first come, first serve basis, because we are required to collect a full indirect, and foundations usually only will pay a 10 to 20% indirect rate. And so the President's Office has um, agreed to cover the difference. Um, there's a form that has to be completed, it has to be reviewed. Certain criteria have to be met, but um, that is a possibility. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Valerie. Um, do we have any more burning questions lying around? If so, please put them in the Slido. And then as we're looking forward to some more detailed things, and we get past this overview session, we're gonna be really digging into detail on some of these issues. We'll uh, provide those to the speakers um, who are going into some of these things moving forward, and then we'll make sure that we can get those questions answered as well. So if you have any more burning questions, please put them in the Slido right now, 
Um, I want to finish up by just saying another huge thank you, all of the postdocs for coming and sharing your time with us, all of our speakers. You guys were so great. Uh, I, I cannot imagine this having gone better, so I really, really appreciate all of you so, so much. And Mariana, take it away. All right, this, as I uh, was side chatting Sude and Hugh, this was everything I wanted it to be and more. So uh, you can manifest it is what I'm saying when you have a, a team of uh, willing collaborators. So I wanted to remind everybody that our next session is on October 6th, and that will be with the granting organizations. And we're looking where we're gonna specifically have a program manager from NSF and Noah and Valerie will also be joining us to sort out policies and you know the rules of regulation, if you will. And the other thing to note is you will be getting additional calendar invites that come through for the, the remaining sessions. But other than that, I think we I want to give a round of applause to everybody. Like this was just it's great. I loved it. So thank you for your time and we will be sharing these slides with everyone. So you'll get another email for slides for, for review because a lot of great information has been populated in there. So with that, have a if you're in Boulder, I hear it's rainy and kind of dreary, but <laughs> hopefully you can uh, reach Rebecca at her cabin and she'll have some hot cocoa for you. <laughs> but <laughs> other than that, a heartfelt thank you to everyone. Thank you. Real applause is nice. Yeah, yeah it's satisfying. Yeah. 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 I just should have just unmuted that every time. <laughs> it was, I thought you did that last time. I was like, oh, I was okay. like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah. It was like we did the research reviews, and there are two people, there's like only six of us, but each presenter was really funny. And so there's like a good like laugh. Oh, that was a really that nice really research fun. review. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Both, like, and I think people build on that energy, and it was like, yeah. oh, yeah. it was so good. Like, was yeah, like and it's before. different if everyone's in person. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Was, yeah, I feel like this is yeah. actually for me. It's just like the first ordinary. Event. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> in a good way. It's really nice.